Don't forget to consider me. Okay. Today is the fourth session of the Physical Harmony Seminar. And today we're going to discuss fasting and the role of fasting in creating health and the role of fasting uh, in creating emotional harmony and in spiritual development. Um, some people who naturopaths, as they're called, believe that the main cause of illness is what they call chemical asphyxiation. That is, that our cells gradually lose the ability to breathe and to receive the nutrients which they need because of the large quantity of chemical substances in the blood. And that this is a result of uh, eating the wrong kinds of foods, uh, eating the wrong combinations of foods, the wrong amounts of foods, poor digestion, and this leads to a toxic environment within the body. Uh, fasting is the most effective way to clean the inner part of the body. When we fast, when we don't take in food substances, or when we take in simple food substances which don't require a lot of energy to digest them and to absorb them, then the body can attend to its house cleaning. It can start attending to looking for what parts of the body, which, what foreign substances, whether they be old, weak cells, or cancerous cells, or tumors, or chemical substances, which are not beneficial to the body, and it can attend to eating them, to destroying them, to dismantling them, and to eliminating them from the physical body. So uh, fasting is an effective way for cleaning the body. It's also a way in which all animals uh, have found that they can recover from illness. It's the natural thing for a man to do, as it is for a dog or a cat, when he is ill, is not to eat. And by not eating, the body's energies go towards healing. So let's investigate that process. What happens when we fast? First of all, there is this removal of toxic waste, this removal of whatever is not necessary in the physical body. Uh, secondly, there is an increase in the production of new healthy cells. Just as, w just as when we cut our hair, our hair grows more abundantly, or when we cut our nails, our nails grow more abundantly. Or when we give blood, our blood is produced, red blood cells are produced more abundantly. Fasting is also a stimulus for the body to create new healthy cells more abundantly. In fact, in a, in a research done on 11 uh, women and 19 men who walked 325 miles in 10 days, that's about 32 miles a day, while fasting, the levels of sugar and the levels of proteins and amino acids in the blood remained stable. That is, although they were not eating and they were walking 32 miles a day, uh, the body was able, without eating anything, to produce those proteins, amino acids, and sugar which were necessary for the body. Uh, thirdly, the lungs and the liver and the kidneys uh, and all the organs of elimination are purified, rested and purified, cleaned, so that we begin, they begin to detoxify themselves. This may result in some cases of uh, when someone has a lot of toxic waste within him, various forms of um, healing crises in which we have these toxins moving out of the body through pimples or boils or uh, skin problems or headaches or various forms of, of uh, symptoms that, that the body is getting rid of these materials which are unwanted. Also, the digestive system and the, uh, the system for absorption are also rested so that when we stop fasting, they have a much more powerful 
ability to digest effectively the food that we eat. So the, the eliminative system is cleaned and rejuvenated, but also the digestive and the assimilative system. But also the nervous system is relaxed, although the first days of a fast or the first times one fasts, one may not feel relaxed, one may feel a certain nervousness or tension or anxiety. But once one has become used to fasting, invariably one feels more relaxed, more energized, more balanced. The mind has greater clarity and there is also a greater spiritual awareness. And that's why all religions, regardless of the religion, uh, have fasting before the main religious holidays because through that fasting there is a heightened spiritual awareness and a heightened ability to receive spiritual experience. And that could be the American Indians or the Hindus or the Christians or the Jews or the Muslims. It makes no difference. All religions and all spiritual paths have discovered the, the spiritualizing effect on the senses and on the mind of fasting, or at least of abstaining from foods such as meat, which uh, reduce the spiritual awareness of that person. So there is a harmonization of the uh, nervous system and a balancing also of the endocrine system and of all the chemistry of the body. Now, uh, some other results. Uh, is that many people have healed themselves from a wide variety of illnesses, such as arthritis, cancer, rheumatism, gallstones, uh, all types of illnesses have been healed through fasting. There are a number of clinics in Europe, especially in Germany and Switzerland, where this kind of thinking was developed quite a number of years ago, and also in Austria. Uh, where there are clinics where thousands of people go every year uh, to do fasting for various, for healing various illnesses. In Russia, they have found that fasting is also an effective tool for working with persons with schizophrenia. And in one study, 64% of schizophrenic persons found improvement after about 20 to 30 days of controlled fasting. I'm not saying that's absolute fasting, but controlled diet and to a certain degree fasting had a very positive effect on their mental condition. In experiments on worms, on earthworms, worms which fasted every other day lived 50 times the lifespan of worms which ate every day. That's not 50 more days, it's 50 times the lifespan. So if the other worms lived 10 days, the other ones lived 500 days. And in rats, uh, which fasted every other day, the rats that fasted lived two and a half times the lifespan of the rats which ate every day. It, it seems that giving a rest to a digestive system does help for a longer life. But I would not say that a longer life is the goal. The goal is living well until we die. That is, living with clarity, without illness, without dehabilitation, until the moment that we leave the physical body. However many days we fast, we'll still die. We're not going to, <laughs> we're not going to escape death. Uh, but at least we can manage to live healthily until we leave the physical body. How f safe fasting is and how many days one can fast there are uh, a number of examples of persons fasting a, a large number of days. We don't suggest long fasts unless someone has a serious illness and with the guidance of an experienced doctor or a person who has experience in guiding persons with fasts. But there are persons who have fasted 140 days, 200 days with, with juices. I personally know a man here in Greece who fasted 40 days with only water to cure his asthma. We don't suggest such long fasts for the process of self-attunement or for spiritual growth. I consider such fasts to be a healing process for persons who are seriously ill. What we would suggest is that if someone is starting out a path of self-attunement, that he may want to do 
some one-day fast. He may want to increase them to two or three-day fast. Occasionally throughout the year, he may want to do a week-long fast. And as time goes on, uh, and he feels his body is pure, then I think once a week is sufficient for him to, as long as he's not eating any more toxic foods, fasting one day a week, uh, perhaps on water, keeps the body clean and functioning well. Now there are many kinds of fasts, and you would have to de decide what kind of fast uh, is most suitable to you. One type of fast is a water fast, in which we drink only pure water, and usually in such cases we get bottled water, which mineral water, which we are sure is pure and beneficial, and nothing else. And uh, I would not suggest you do, that you do more than one day of water fasting without uh, consulting with someone, especially if you have low blood pressure or anemia or any kinds of stomach problems. However, you may not have any problems. Uh, uh, you may do up to three days, perhaps without having any problems at all. Just know that the first fasts that we do are always the most difficult and the most symptoms of detoxification and the most unpleasant systems are, symptoms are experienced. After that, we don't have those symptoms. The second type of fasting is juice fasting, in which we make fresh juices of fruits or vegetables which are in season and which are ripe. The juice it should be made that moment and drunk immediately, uh, and not to be made for the whole day and kept for a long period of time. Now there's a war going on between the naturopaths who advocate wa water fasting and the naturopaths who advocate juice fasting. Those who advocate water fasting said, well, since you're not taking any nutrients in the body, it's more effective. Those who advocate the juice fasting say that because juice is alkaline, uh, it helps to, to balance the acidity of the body, which is usually the result of illness in the human body, and also that one gets the nutrients that he needs in order to function uh, in a regular way, in an ordinary way, in his daily life. My suggestion is that for one day, water fasting is good. For more than that, you may want to try juice fasting. Now, these are the two basic kinds of fasting. But if someone doesn't feel that he can do either water fasting or juice fasting and feels that he needs some other kind of nutrient or help, then he may add vegetable broths. Now, we make vegetable broth by boiling some vegetables which are in season, some carrots, beets, potatoes, and then we give the vegetables to others <laughs> to eat, and we just drink the broth, eh, which is left over. We may put a little lemon juice in that. And especially in the evening, because some people have difficulty in sleeping if they haven't eaten something before they sleep, this is very warming to the stomach and satisfying. It helps one to relax and to be able to sleep, perhaps, uh, if he has difficulty with that. So one can do a fast with juices and alternatively some broth, some vegetable broth. And even if we do with juices and broth, we will always drink a large amount of fresh, pure water. Water is always a part of fasting, except for the macrobiotic fast, which is with rice, which I'll explain later on. Now, if someone feels that even this is too much, it's too difficult for him, he can fast on raw fruits. That is, uh, there are certain fruits which exist in certain seasons of the year which are very purifying for the body. In the summer we have watermelon, which is very purifying for the kidneys. In the autumn we have grapes, which is very purifying for the blood. In the spring we have cherries, which are very beneficial for arthritic and rheumatic problems. In the fall we have apples, in the winter we have apples, which are very good for liver problems and gallbladder problems, also pears. And so in each season, we're offered certain kinds of fruit, and we can just do a fruit fast. We can, without making juices, make the juice in our mouth by chewing very well that fruit and eat for one or two or three days only that fruit during that season. And it's a very healing and purifying process for the body and for the mind. 
If someone finds that he can't even do that, then he may want to do then a raw diet for a few days in which he eats only fruit, raw fruit, and raw vegetables and avoids any kind of cooked foods, or cheese, or, or bread, or any kind of other substance. It's just having raw salads and fruits for a few days also will help to purify the body. And remember what we said last week, that this supplies an abundant amount of enzymes to the physical body, which helps to strengthen the, ner the uh, immune system and heal the body. And in all of those cases, we drink plenty of water at least a liter, if not a liter and a half of water. Then there is the, uh, an opposite type of fasting, which comes from the macrobiotic tradition, which is ri brown rice fasting, in which we eat only brown rice and nothing else, and we don't drink much water. We're allowed to have up to two cups of liquid a day with the rice, and it's usually in the form of a hot herbal beverage, some kind of uh, herbs. And uh, we just eat rice. <laughs> but this rice can have a little bit of tamari in it to make it a little more acceptable to the body. Uh, and this could go on for from five to ten days. It's also a cleansing process. The body is cleansed. People who have difficulty with bowel movements may find this uh, creates a bit of constipation in the beginning, but after a while this will be uh, taken care of. This is more effective for persons who uh, have, are recovering from drugs or persons who uh, are not well grounded in their lives because juice fasting and, and fruits are yin. They cause the mind to become more expanded and the body to become more expanded. Persons who have been taking drugs for some period of time, whether they be nar narcotics or hallucinogenic uh, drugs or uh, tranquilizers may find a fasting with rice more effective because it grounds them as it also purifies them simultaneously. Yeah. So these are various types of fasting. We have water fasting, we have water and juice fasting, we can add broths if we want. We have raw vegetable, raw fruit fasting, we have fruits and vegetables and then we have rice and each person. And of course, rice fasting is more logical in the winter. Sometimes it's difficult to do juice fasting in the winter. Our body wants calories in order to handle the cold. And rice fasting is a good solution for that. Whereas in the summer, we would choose vegetables or juices. Now, how about getting started for a fast? Uh, we don't do what a lot of people would imagine, that is to eat as much as possible a few days before <laughs> we fast in order to be <laughs> ready for the fast. The opposite is what we need to do, that is to begin cleansing the body and preparing the body for the fast, which means eating simply for a few days before fasting. Uh, and also many uh, fasting advocates suggest a cleansing of the bowels at the start of the fast. And this could be done with an enema, or it could be done with some kind of uh, castor oil or some kind of uh, salts which stimulate the intestines to empty themselves. This cleansing of the, of the intestines also makes the fasting easier because one of the mechanisms which creates hunger is the presence of feces in the intestines. And if we eliminate that from the beginning of the fast, we are, all, we are ensured also uh, that we're not going to be accumulating a large number of toxic waste in the, in the body. And secondly, uh, that we will not be so hungry. Now I can read you a, a schedule, a fasting schedule from one uh, health clinic in Germany uh, like how does the day go? What, what do people take into their bodies? At 9 in the morning, they start with a herb tea. At 11, we have a fruit juice. And some people choose to, to mix the juice half and half with water. Others take the juice directly as it is. At 1 o'clock, a vegetable juice. We don't mix 
vegetables with fruits in the same juice. We won't put uh, carrots and oranges, for example. Neither do we tend to mix citrus fruits with sweet fruits. It is separately we'll have sweet fruits. If we're not going to have just one thing, we could just have just apples. Or we could have apples in pears. We could have just carrots or carrots and beets. Perhaps a little cabbage or parsley if we want. Uh, or we can have citrus. We won't mix these three different kinds of things, vegetables with sweet fruits or with sour acidic fruits. Then at 4 o'clock, a herb tea. At 7, another juice. And in the evening at 9, a, another juice or a broth or a tea. So it's about 5 to 6 glasses of juice or broth during the day, including a, another liter or a liter and a half of water throughout the day. This will be a, this is not an absolute thing. Each person has his own needs. But in Midanunda, when we do our fasting in the summer seminars, it comes out about this way. About five juices a day seems to be sufficient. Now, helping with the process of detoxification, helping these toxins to get out of the body. Now, there are some specialists who suggest that we don't do anything. We just leave the body to have its own eliminative process. But my experience is, and the experience of many others, is that it is helpful to help these toxic waste get out of the body. One very effective way is the enema. Now, an enema can be done uh, during fasting. There are some people who, who suggest once a day or even twice a day. I think that's very, uh, it's too much <laughs> for the intestine. And I would suggest once every two or three days, especially if this fasting causes um, constipation. There are some people who have good bowel movements, and even though they're not taking in solid food, continue to have eliminative, uh, to eliminate feces. Other people need food to push this, uh, uh, what is called the um, peristaltic movement. When we stop fasting, the peristaltic movement of the, the small and large intestine stops, and that's why hunger stops. Is hunger exists only for the first three days. After the third day, if we're not taking in solid food, the peristaltic movement stops, and we don't experience hunger anymore until the body arrives to the point where it may begin to starve itself of essential nutrients. Otherwise, it won't experience at least it won't experience much hunger. Hunger is something which we experience for the first three days, and then when the body comes into danger. Secondly, second way of helping the detoxification is a process of cleaning the sinuses and the nostrils with salt water, in which we take a, a glass of warm water, the temperature of the body, we add a spoon, uh, a small spoon, uh, a teaspoon of salt, but as they say in Greek, kofto, that is leveled out, without it, not a mound, is level. We put it in the water, we mix it, and then if you don't have a special device, which is for pouring it into the nose, you can use your hand, in which you put this water in the hand, you close one nostril, and you suck it up into the nostrils and it all the way through into the mouth cavity. And then we blow it out of the mouth and of the one nostril and of the other nostril. And then we put it in the left hand and we draw it up to the left nostril, comes back into the mouth, cleaning up all that cavity there. And then in this way, three times alternatively through each nostril. And then blow our nose quite effectively so that we remove any kind of mucus accumulation which may exist in this area of the body. There's also what is called a stomach wash, which may not seem very pleasant to most people, but it is a fact that when someone is ill, um, it is a very effective way of helping the body to heal itself. In this case, we drink about a liter of warm water, the temperature of the body, with uh, about a tablespoon of salt in it. We drink it rather quickly. 
we do some movements of the abdomen, which I won't show you at this point. And then we go and regurgitate this. We put our fingers in our mouths and we throw this water out. We vomit the water out. And this cleans the abdominal area, the, the stomach, which is the depository of mucus in the body. The amount of mucus in the li inner lining of the body is a very delicate balance. When it's too little, it, the body is ten tends towards inflammation, such as ulcers. When it's too much, this mucous membrane becomes a breeding ground for disease. And it's much easier for us to have colds or various kinds of infections which in the, within the body. We want to keep a delicate balance of this mucus. Because most contemporary persons eat a lot of white sugar and white flour and white rice and don't eat very much fiber in their diet, most people have too much mucus in their bodies. And also the main contributor of mucus is dairy products also because a number of people cannot assimilate all the dairy products that they're taking, then there is an accumulation. And that is why when we have a cold coming on, it's good to cut off completely all intake of any form of dairy products and of white flour products. And we'll see that the body will recover much more quickly. We should just take a lot of citrus, a lot of lemon, uh, onions, garlic, these kinds of things, which open up the body, remove this excessive phlegm from the body. Another way of helping the body to purify itself now these techniques which I mentioned to you, I mentioned to you rather briefly, you can read details about them in the books that we have uh, in the center, which are in Greek still because I haven't, they haven't been published yet in English. But one is called Self-Healing, Aftotherapia. It has all those techniques in it. The other is called Yoga uh, for Health and Vitality, Yogi uh, Okay, for peace and vitality, and the other is the atrophy, uh, that is the in a book about healthy eating. All of these three books have these cleansing techniques in them. Breathing is a process of removing toxins. Uh, that is why our breath becomes quite foul when we fast and perhaps offensive to the others. We may have to brush our teeth more frequently or rinse our mouth up more frequently when we're fasting because a large amount of toxins begin to go out through the lungs and through the breath. And that's why it smells badly. So by doing deep breathing exercises, breathing in deeply, holding for a short period of time and exhaling deeply, we can help the body to remove these toxic substances. Exercise and sweating to a mild degree is also a way of helping the body to release these toxins through the, through the skin, through the pores of the skin. And for the same reason, uh, uh, taking a bath in salt water helps. That is taking, we can fill our bathtub if we, if we can't go to the ocean. We can fill our bathtub with, with sea salt it is in it for a full bathtub, about a pound of sea salt. And we can lie in that. And by osmotic pressure, uh, the various, uh, w the water which is in the body will be drawn out. And as that water which is in the body is drawn out into the solution of the salt, it will take with it the various toxic materials which are stored in the pores of the skin. And in this way, we clean the skin. We help the body to release these waste products. So taking a hot bath in salt water is an all, another way of helping this purification process to take place. And any kind of movement, exercise, that is, we need to, uh, one should not simply lie down when one fasts. One should have movement, not excessive movement, but one should have movement. Now, frequently, when one starts fasting, in the beginning of one's fasting career, we could say. Or when one is doing a, 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 length, a longer fast, or when one is ill 
and there is a toxic situation in the body, we may have what we call healing crises. A healing crisis is not an illness. It's the body's effort to get well. But this effort may bring unpleasant uh, reactions, such as headaches, one of the most frequent symptoms of detoxification while fasting is a headache. Uh, pains in the stomach, uh, dizziness perhaps, uh, various uh, boils or pimples appearing or rashes appearing on the skin, a tendency towards vomiting, another effort for the body to throw out these toxic materials, D difficulty in sleeping, or shivering. All these are possible symptoms which one may experience as the body is trying to refine its balance, as it's taking this opportunity to find a new balance and a new state of health. Well, one, of course, has to respect these symptoms, and we, don't, we should not ignore them, but we should consult some person who is guiding us in this fasting so that he, from his experience, will tell us whether we should stop or not. In most cases, we do not need to stop. We can continue. But we have to be logical about this. You know, <laughs> we should not be harming ourselves. Mm -hmm. But in most conditions, simply because we have a headache, it's not a reason to start eating. I mean, it is natural. It's what we, we can expect. It. Also, do not get the impression that if you're not getting a headache, then it's not working. We're not saying that. We're just saying that if you do have one, don't be surprised. If you do feel uh, nauseous, don't feel surprised. It's one of the things that happens. What can we do to relieve these symptoms? Often a hot bath will help. If we can find someone to give us a massage, this also helps. Uh, a hot herbal tea very frequently causes the symptoms to recede. Sometimes uh, an enema will help these symptoms to go away that will re relieve us from our tension. Sleep is always a healing process in, in such cases. If you are knowledgeable of yoga exercises or any kinds of exercises, but specifically yoga exercises, these can also reduce the symptoms or eliminate them. And of course deep relaxation techniques. All of these methods can help to calm the body and help these symptoms to, to recede. So I would suggest that for getting started, we might try one day a week. And then if we feel that our diet has not been optimal for the last years, we may decide that twi twice or three times a year, we might want to try three days or four days or five days. If we are ill, and we want to heal an illness, then we may consult someone and work on a longer fast, 10 days, two weeks, perhaps even more, for healing a serious health problem. Often fasts are done at the change of the season in spring. It comes naturally with the Easter holidays here in Greece, in which many people fast during the Holy Week. Uh, it serves also a spiritual purpose, but it also helps the blood to change its consistency. We have a, another blood consistency in the winter and another blood consistency in the summer. So spring and fall are good times for fasting, as also is the, the, the summertime when it's hot and we don't feel the need for a lot of food. It's also an opportunity for persons to cleanse their body. And there's an abundance of fruits and vegetables to do that. Now, who should avoid fasting? Or who should avoid fasting at least until they have the okay from their doctor or from some very experienced counselor in fasting? Persons with ulcers. The, a, a person with ulcers should not have his stomach empty for long periods of time. Persons with uh, anemia. It doesn't mean that you cannot fast, but it just requires that you, that you take a good look at this and see what effect it has on you. You may want to fast with vegetables and fruits and not simply with water. You have to look at it. 
persons with low blood pressure. It doesn't mean you can't fast, but you have to see what effect it will have on you. If you become dizzy, if you can manage to keep active or not. Persons who are taking drugs, especially drugs which require food to be taken beforehand, otherwise they make holes in the stomach. Diabetic persons should not be fasting. Persons with an active tuberculosis should check with the doctor. Persons with active tumors, cancerous tumors, should check with the doctor. It's also a healing process for cancer, but one should have specific guidance. Persons with weak hearts and persons with mental disease. We've said that it can be healing in the case of schizophrenia, but uh, one should have guidance in these cases. That is, not eating can accentuate one's paranoid uh, imaginations. It is, food is a grounding thing. It's a grounding process. It can, persons who are not grounded and have a tendency towards fantasy, and especially negative fantasy, when they don't eat, these fantasies can become even greater. So it is important for persons who are having paranoid kinds of feelings to be eating regularly. Now about breaking a fast. Now if the fast is for one day, then it's no big thing. We can eat regularly the next day. Uh, but if we're going to be fasting more than one day, uh, let's say three days or more, then we want to break in gradually. That m much damage is done by people to themselves by uh, eating too much or eating the wrong things when they're coming off a fast. And all the good that they have created is destroyed. Yeah. So this is a program which comes from Otto Buchinger's um, clinic in Germany. The first day, they will be given a half an apple in the morning and a small bowl of vegetable soup for lunch. The vegetable soup, of course, is passed through a mixer and it's uh, become like a puree. And the juices, which are ordinarily taken. The second day, some soaked figs or prunes in the morning, a vegetable salad in the evening, and a vegetable soup, uh, in the, excuse me, a vegetable salad in the afternoon, and a vegetable soup in the evening. This is without bread, and without cheese, and without these kinds of things. And two apples in between. And the third day, same as the second day, but we add yogurt in the morning, we add a potato with the salad in the lunch, and we add a piece of bread or cheese with the evening meal. And as of the fourth day, uh, we eat regularly. Right? So that's one suggestion for breaking out of the, of the fasting. Um, so that very briefly is an introduction to fasting. Uh, it's a process of healing and a process of mental clarity and a process of spiritual development and spiritual preparation which has been used for thousands of years. It's not something new. It exists in every culture. Uh, and it makes a lot of sense. And it comes instinctively from man. Uh, when, uh, and there's something that we can include in our process of creating health and harmony and in our process of spiritual development. It's something that I would suggest that you try Give it a try this week if you like, so we can discuss it next week or when you feel ready. Now, fasting one day, there's a question here. Uh, fasting one day ordinarily means that I just don't eat on Wednesday or Friday or Saturday. Uh, but that is actually about 36 hours of fasting because two, even, two nights are included in that. So if someone wants to fast 24 hours, it's a simpler version, would be um, to eat on Friday afternoon and then not eat Friday evening and not eat Saturday morning and eat again in the full cycle, arriving at Saturday afternoon. That, is, that would be 24 hours of giving a rest to the stomach. 
So it's sort of an easy version of, of a one-day fast. So a one-day fast could be not eating at all on Friday, which means I stop eating on Thursday evening and I start eating on Saturday morning. Or it could mean that I, st I eat one meal and then I skip two meals. And when I arrive to that same meal, then I eat that. That's another possibility. That you could, it's an easier possibility, which you might want to try if you find the other difficult. Any questions about fasting? Okay, if you don't have any questions. Ah, uh, yes, we didn't discuss that. Um, in each culture, we also find another kind of fasting um, in which we make a certain cocktail of lemon or some citrus with some sweetener. Uh, in the Mediterranean, that's done with the carob syrup, uh, in, the, in, the, in Lebanon, in those countries, they use carob, the carob and lemon to create a drink. There's one spoonful, soup spoon of this syrup, which comes from the carob bean, and one soup spoon of lemon. You mix it up and you drink it five or ten glasses a day, and you, just, you can pass ten days that way. Another one uh, is the maple syrup fast, uh, syrup which comes from Canada and the U.S., but it should be 100% pure maple syrup, uh, in which you have a tablespoon of maple syrup and a tablespoon of lemon juice and a few dashes of paprika, paprika, uh, or some people put cayenne pepper, a dash of cayenne pepper, and one can pass to a day or two days or three days, or some people do even 10 days for healing process, of just uh, drinking this, this cocktail. The advantage of this is that we can prepare this in the morning. We can have it with us in a thermos or in a jar throughout the day, and that we don't need to be near a juicer all day long. I would not say that it gives us the same nutrients as a juice fast, but from the detoxification point of view, it does offer a great deal of detoxification. So it's another alternative, perhaps a simpler alternative, for persons who don't want to get involved in setting up a juicer and juicing and all that process. It's, it's, yes, lemon fasting is also an effective fast process. Any other questions? Okay. If not, we can break up into our groups. And we said that from today on, we will be meeting only until 7.30 because the groups are small and it's not necessary to be meeting for a long time.